Adams Library, I'd like to welcome you to Groveland's Town Hall tonight for this special program. The time and effort to get a movie made is immense. To be recognized and given an award on top of the success is tremendous. It goes without saying that Groveland native Geraldine White Dreyfus, who has won an Oscar and been nominated four times, is very successful and has an incredible career so far. It gives me great pleasure in welcoming Geraldine back to Groveland tonight. Thanks for coming. try to animate the, um, my talk. Um, so I've been making films now for 15 years and um, really got my start um, when I moved to Salt Lake City. I had been working for a magazine called Double Take, which was um, a magazine devoted to nonfiction storytelling. And I had been got engaged in that um, magazine with a professor that I had at Harvard named Robert Coles who was a real inspiration to me and a mentor, teaching me about what he called a narrative voice, how in nonfiction and in, truth and in, in, in real storytelling and documentary work, there were these narrative voices, there were these ways that we could find um, a little bit of ourselves through understanding the stories of others. And um, so he really introduced me to the whole nonfiction documentary world. And when I moved out to Utah, I had been working in philanthropy and I'd been working for this magazine and I was kind of looking around trying to figure out well, where am I going to work and the Olympics were going to happen and um, so I thought about applying for some jobs there and then Sundance the Film Festival was there and as it turned out I was very lucky that Robert Redford um, was a huge fan of Double Take Magazine and Robert Coles and Robert Coles was very famous for advising um, a lot of great writers and, um, and actors uh, as a psychologist, as a, psych as a psychiatrist. He was actually a psychiatrist to the Kennedy family, and he was Bobby Kennedy's speechwriter, and he, he had um, worked with um, Graham Greene and Walker Percy and a, and a lot of good writers, and um, Robert Redford was a huge a fan of, of his. So through that, I was able to um, meet the folks at Sundance, and we started out uh, exploring how to bring documentary storytelling, nonfiction storytelling, to the stage that Sundance had created for independent film. So we kind of got into the very ground level, which was great, um, uh, because at that time, documentaries were still considered kind of spinach, and the only thing that you would, you know, the only place you could really watch them was on public television, and now, at the same time, there was all this explosion of, um, of new cable and distribution opportunities, so it was a real opportunity for people to make stories and then find the audiences um, to connect to. So. I've been very lucky to kind of be on that, that crest of a wave that has, has sort of um, happened in the last 20 years because literally nobody funded documentaries because you didn't need to. You had CBS, ABC, NBC, you had great investigative journalism, and you had public television. And then all of the commercial networks have basically gutted their newsrooms and there's not a lot of uh, money or attention that goes into investigative journalism and television anymore with the exception of Frontline and 60 Minutes. So there was a real opportunity for, um, a real market opportunity for individual filmmakers to go out and tell great stories. Um, the problem was is that the burden of that storytelling was on the filmmaker. You had to take all the risk, you had to raise all the money, then you had to hope you could bring it to a festival like Sundance and hope that you could sell your film. So there's a lot of people that make films that never actually get to see their films distributed, but more and more now you can, with all the technology changes, you can look, you can distribute your films through YouTube, through social media, through you, know, you can build your audience. Um, so um, so today I was what I was going to show you was um, I had a little montage of all the films I've been involved with, just sort of like a. A visual of them, and we, we we started a company called Impact Partners, and the idea was to invest in social impact documentaries with the idea that film is now um, a new tool that you can have in your toolbox for social change, whether you're working um, in philanthropy and trying to amplify and align a social message, getting investing in a film as a way to kind of have someone take a deep dive, have them have the mainstream public take a deep dive and look at a, a situation for 90 minutes. 
um, is a great opportunity uh, to learn. And I think it's a great social innovation because <laughs> these filmmakers, they spend three to five years of their life looking at a subject. They bring it to you for free on Netflix or at our HBO or public television or $10 in the movie theater, and it costs about a million dollars to make these films. So really what you're getting as a consumer is um, three to five years of a really bright, creative person taking a look at something, really trying to distill it and play it back to you in a way that is more like an essay um, than it is like the old linear style documentaries that we still only see on television. I think the genre is just exploding. There's all sorts of new um, creative ways that people are telling stories and, and, and engaging audiences. So, so the, with, the, uh, with the advent of all this new technology, we decided to, my partner and I, Dan Kogan, who lives in New York, decided to create a fund to invest in social impact documentaries. And we went out and we raised um, uh, money from um, high net worth individuals and foundations that really understood that in today's day and age, you have to have a media strategy. I mean, if I had been a student of philanthropy before I got into film, and so I sort of, I worked in philanthropy with a lot of very wealthy families, and, and you, you look at the founding of this country, and you look at the Carnegies and the Rockefellers, you know, they, they, were, in, they were industrialists, and they built our railroads, and they built our institutions, and their philanthropy was industrial. It built our hospitals, and our universities, and um, our libraries, right? And then the next generation of wealth really made their money from money. So you had this different relationship to capital. And then the next generation made their money in venture capital, which then wanted people to be more socially entrepreneurial and have more results. Well, this generation of wealth is made through information. It's made through data. It's made through who can get the information out fastest. So there's no time in the history of the world where the moral currency is information and content. So content is king right now. So like a lot of our philanthropists and a lot of our politicians and a lot of our people that own news media understand they control a lot of power because they distribute ideas that influence all of you, all of us, right? So we decided to create a fund to try to be investing in stories that would really stand the test of time, that would really show us who we are, who we're becoming. And we've, um, we've, uh, we've invested in over 80 films now. We do about 12 uh, to 20 films a year. And um, we've had the good fortune of making um, a huge difference in, in addition to make, in winning a lot of awards. And so the, the case study I wanted to talk to you about tonight was really, um, what, for me personally, uh, I've been interested in how do you use media to get at cultural beliefs. Like it's, it's great to use media to show something that's wrong and then you have a call to action and you can change a law, right? That's, that's what we did with Invisible War. We said one out of three people who go into the military are sexually assaulted. You know, they can't, um, they don't have any recourse. There's a problem with the chain of command where if you go to your immediate officer, it's either the perpetrator or the friend of a perpetrator or someone that doesn't want an investigation on their watch or someone that doesn't want to take a good soldier out of the field, and so there's a con there's a built-in conflict of interest, and we knew that if we could show and prove what was happening with the culture of assault in the military, we could change the law, and we were able to do that. But changing the belief system so that people actually believe that people are sexually assaulted, it turned out to be um, a lot harder problem. So after we did the movie Invisible War, we went to college campuses all over the country. Every single time, people came up to us afterwards and said, this happened to me, young woman, this happened to me, I was raped, I went to report it, they didn't believe me, they swept it under the rug, they, taught, they told me um, that they, they didn't want to embarrass the, the name of the institution or that they didn't want this young woman to embarrass their legacy of being a fifth generation at Notre Dame or a fifth generation at another college. So, we, we didn't intend to make this movie, but we, we really couldn't turn our back on it, which, which became The Hunting Ground. And while we were lo really looking at The Hunting Ground, we really looked into the kind of culture of rape and the rape culture, this idea, this belief that you don't believe people when they say they've been sexually assaulted. And how could we convince people to first you know, start 
to stop and listen and pay attention and believe um, people when they report it. And one of the things that I think is the most compelling is that in every single other crime, every crime across the board, robbery, arson, fraud, you know, domestic violence, there's a four to eight percent chance of people that falsely report. Four percent. But no police officer, when you call up and tell them that your television was robbed out of their house, say, what were you wearing when you, they robbed your television? <laughs> hmm, were you drinking when they robbed your television? What, you weren't even home when they robbed your television? You know, I mean, you don't do that. You take down the facts, you do an investigation, and you come back, and you, <clears throat> but the culture around assault and the belief around um, just really what provokes it and, and who's responsible for it is so, has been so entrenched that both men and women don't believe assailants, whether they're male or female. It's, it, your first instinct is you don't want to think that it happened. So how are we going to get at this question? So we did this film, um, uh, The Hunting Ground, and we were really able to, to talk to women and men across the country and share their experiences um, on camera, but also we told it through the eyes of, of young women who were trying to organize for greater justice. And it turned out that there became a federal investigation. There are 174 institutions in this country that are under investigation for ne neglect on sexual harassment on college campuses. And they, the, the ruling goes through Title IX, so the idea is, is if, it, if it's not equally safe to go to school, if, you're, if, you're, if one out of four women are being raped before their sophomore year in college, which is now the statistic, it's not equally fa fair or safe for you to go to college. So right now, in America, today, if you're in the military, you're more likely to be raped in the military than you are to be hurt in the line of duty, okay? Right now, in America, today, you're more likely to be, if you're 18 years old and a young woman, you're more likely to be raped if you go to college than not. So we clearly have a problem on our hands. And there's all sorts of ways of trying to understand that problem. And what I was going to show with these clips was our attempt to understand it. So we made a film called Misrepresentation that looked at the misrepresentation and the hypersexualization of girls in the media. What is that teaching our girls? What is that teaching our boys? How does pornography play in? How does the hypersexualization of commercials and advertising, how do all these things shape our beliefs about what it's like to be? <coughs> What, what, what your role is as, as a young um, man or woman growing up in our, today's culture. Then we made a film called The Mask You Live In, which tried to look at what are we teaching our boys through the media, you know, about um, exploitation and, and uh, dominion and rights, and whether it's video games that are so physically um, violent uh, against women, and, and, and more and more of our young boys are learning about sex for the first time and pornography. How is that changing their idea of intimacy? How is that changing their idea of um, relationship? So we don't go into those issues in the hunting ground or invisible war, but as a way of trying to understand what is the cultural backdrop that we're, our kids are being raised in, we, we funded a body of work. Um, and all of it is trying to get at how do we ask better questions about um, this issue of, of, of violence, especially violence against women in our, in, in our culture today. So then when we came to the hunting ground and were able to document um, to our astonishment that, that we had in our film that it was one in five young women are raped before their sophomore year, first semester of their sophomore year. And then there was a national study done by Harvard and they found out it was one in four. And in some cases, it's one in three. Dartmouth is the worst. It's, it's really interesting, um, uh, the, the sort of statistics at, at these different schools that we looked at. So we decided that you know, we were going to go big on this one, and um, we needed to get um, a song written for the, for the movie um, that would reach young millennials, because not many millennials actually watch documentaries. They do a lot of work on social media. So we were able to get Diane Warren um, who's a Grammy award-winning songwriter to write a song called Till it, Till, Till it Happens to You and had Lady Gaga sing it. And what was so interesting about that is that Lady Gaga had a new album coming out and her record label would not put the song on the label because she, she, they said it's about rape, nobody's going to want to watch it. Nobody's going to want to listen to it. So it never got on her record and it was never released on the radio. 
So we leaked it. We sent it out on the internet, and within a week, 15 million people had downloaded the song all over the world. So then it gets nominated for a Grammy. It's never been on the radio, right? Then it gets nominated for Best Original Song at the, um, at the Oscars. And we get this, we're all excited, the song's um, you know, nominated for an Academy Award, Lady Gaga's coming, we got President, Vice President Biden to come and introduce her. And again, all of this is about getting media, getting publicity, trying to get people to pay attention to an issue that is very uncomfortable for people to look at, right? <laughs> so, the great thing that happened was, um, Two days before, two, a week before the Academy Awards, we get this call from the Academy Awards <coughs> saying, "Well, it's going to cost one hundred eighty-five thousand dollars to um, to have Lady Gaga perform." And I said, "Oh, I didn't realize it was that much money, but you know, you guys you have three billion people watching you. It must have advertising dollars for that." And they're like, "Well, no, we're a nonprofit." And I said. Well, you're telling me that we have to pay for Lady Gaga to sing the song? And they're like, yeah, well, because usually your, your record label pays for it, or your studio. And in our case, the company that bought the film went bankrupt. CNN got threatened with a lawsuit from um, uh, one of the subjects in the film, and they only showed it once. One time they showed this movie, the Sunday after Thanksgiving at 10 o'clock at night. The whole idea was it was supposed to be their Thanksgiving weekend, you're home with your kids, you're watching this movie, you're having a conversation, you're talking to your juniors in high school, you're talking about this issue. They, they completely shelved it. So, um, so anyway, so we didn't have a distributor to pay for it, and we didn't have a record label to pay for it. So we went out to all our friends that, you know, because the film had gotten so much publicity, and we just said, like, we did a fund drive, we raised $185,000 in two days, and we got 50 survivors that were all in the movie to be on stage with Lady Gaga. And it was just one of those moments in your life where you just, you just can't believe, you know, you almost feel like things leaving people's bodies in, 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 in the rehearsal. And then, at, you know, at the actual Academy Awards, like, people were crying and there was like this, when, when the song didn't win and the James Bond song won instead, people actually gasped. It was like, people were like, oh, they were horrified. They just thought it was like the Lady Gaga runway. So it was, it was really, really fun. And then after that, you just saw this tremendous movement of people coming out from um, everybody from other celebrities to singers, sharing their own stories for the first time, which is what happened to us when we would show the movie. People would then say, this happened to me too, or, you know, and, um, so then, um, along comes our Stanford swimming case, and the woman that was a subject in the film called the producer, Amy Ziering, and said, I'm thinking about reading this letter at this trial, and I, I don't know if I'm making a big mistake. And so she sent it to her, and Amy said, not only is it not a mistake, it's so important, this is one of the most beautiful pieces of writing I've ever heard, um, we, we should publish it. So Amy, because she's my age, thinks, well, I'm going to call the New York Times. And her daughter goes, Mom, nobody reads the New York Times anymore. Link it to BuzzFeed. <laughs> well, go link it to BuzzFeed. <laughs> the thing goes viral in like 10 minutes, right? And now you've seen the most amazing things that have happened in that case where you realize that the culture is shifting away from everybody's concerned about Brock. He made, a, he made a mistake. He, he didn't just make a bad choice. This is, this, is, this is the difference we're trying to do. A bad choice is when you drink and drive when you're in high school. A bad choice is when you stay up late when you have your first job interview. Raping a drunk person and taking pictures and sharing it with people is not a bad choice. There's something very, 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 very standard and deviating from that choice and that decision making. And but some amazingly miraculous things have happened um, since that letter and the conversation. There's legislation that's been passed. There's, there's just a whole um, shift from worrying about the future of the man who made a bad choice and now focusing on the travesty and the trauma and the wreckage, oftentimes, that women carry with them for 16, 20 years. Point in case, there was a woman this week um, who uh, was raped by four football players at Oregon State. And um, again, the coach said they made a bad choice. And, um, and she ended up not, she ended up dropping out of school, becoming a waitress. 16 years later, she dealt with this in therapy. She's now become an advocate. 
and she wrote a letter to this coach who's now at the University of Nebraska. I don't know if you if you follow this, Brian. Yeah, Mike Rye. Mike Rye. It was an amazing, amazing story. So she had said in her letter that she hated him more than the rapist because of how he marginalized it, and nobody asked more questions. And he invited her to come to the University of Nebraska to talk to his football team. So she did. She went and she shared with him, um, just bit, right, like right in the eyes, just said how this was the person that she cursed. You know, Mike Riley was the person that she couldn't forgive. And all the players were watching her and watching him. And he said, "I'm sorry. I should have asked more questions. I didn't know what I know today. That never should have happened to you." And that's really where the healing began. I mean, they embraced each other. They took pictures together. You know, it was like she needed that to move forward. And I think he needed it too. And I think his players learned a lot on that day. So there's a, like that wouldn't have happened five years ago. It just wouldn't have, right? And, and that now you, you see that, that kind of thing that you can't really show on film, but you can sort of see happening in the culture. And that's what motivates me the most about this work is this idea that you can kind of show, you know, get people to think and ask questions about something that they think they know about and, and have, to have them stop themselves in their own tracks and kind of reconsider or, or, you know, think out loud. And sometimes you're clumsy when you're thinking out loud. And I'll, I'll tell you one other funny story. So at the Academy Awards afterwards, they have this big fancy thing called the Governor's Ball. And uh, so, um, Vice President Biden was there because he had introduced um, Lady Gaga. And I happened to be sitting at his table because uh, Rory Kennedy, who's Bobby Kennedy um, Sr.'s daughter, and I make a lot of films together. And she's on the Board of Governors, so that's how I got invited to go, is through her. And uh, so we're sitting there, and, and um, I, I said something. I was, I, I was thinking about it all night long. I said um, to Vice President Biden, I said, you know, I was really proud and grateful that you took the time to be here and give this issue on the, your leadership because uh, they've started an organization called It's On Us, um, which is now embedded in the Department of Education and it's doing the compliance on the 174 universities that are out of compliance or negligent around sexual assault. But I also had made another film four years ago called Anita, which was about Anita Hill. And I don't know if you remember that whole Anita Hill, um, but it was the it was the birth of CNN. So you know you had this Senate, Senate hearing, which was really more like a trial against Anita Hill versus her testifying. Um, and Joe Biden was a young senator, and he was sitting there snickering like a little frat boy with Teddy Kennedy, you know, and like and and I I hadn't remembered that. Um, because I was just like right out of college, like it was sort of like, you know, um, working. Remember everybody, the whole country was talking about it and glued to the TV. And, um, so I said to him, I said, you know, it's amazing to me that you're le you, you, the kind of leadership that I saw. I said, because I have to tell you, I made this other film and I was, I was really kind of taken aback. And he said, he said exactly what Coach Riley said. He said, I know, I didn't know, I didn't know. He goes, and my daughters taught me and my wife taught me. And he said, you know, we didn't know what workplace harassment was. That word was invented because of the Anita Hill trial. We thought this was like some kooky, feminist, crazy, wacko land, like workplace harassment. Now we understand what workplace harassment is. But at the time, we were just, you know, we were just part of the same culture the rest of the country was. And we, were, we had to learn. And we had to be pushed. And that's what, you know, that's what you do when you're in government. You get pushed by people holding you accountable. So I thought it was really great that um, that he was that gracious about it because it really was, I mean, I actually was not trying to be disdainful at all. I just thought to, in my lifetime to see somebody go from there to there was pretty extraordinary. And that's what, I, that's what I mean when I'm talking about kind of how do you change cultural norms, how do you change the way our belief system, how do we start thinking about things a little bit more differently or more thoughtfully. And um, so that was, you know, to me that's, those are some of the kind of highlights and um, that I've uh, ha I've had, and why I know this work makes a difference is because I see those kind of anecdotal things. You know, you see the press, and you see some of the um, the things that do get changed. But when you, when you really see the kinds of conversations um, that get changed by these stories and the and the characters that stay with you because of these stories, I mean, 
in the hunting ground, one of my favorite characters was a police officer from Notre Dame who quit because he was told he was not allowed to, to go to a call to investigate if it came from a player. And he said, that's not right. And he was right that it wasn't right. You know, and that's now changed. And, you know, he going on camera was the equivalent of being a whistleblower in that town. So it took a lot of courage for him to do that. But those are the kinds of things you get to see when you, when you make these films, is people doing these extraordinary, um, courageous things that put them at great risk with their, with their communities by telling the, tr telling the truth of their lives. Um, and then you get to decide as the audience um, what you take away from it. And then the last clip I was going to show you is a film that's coming out this September. I think it's a very, very important film. It's on the same trajectory. Oh, let me just back up. So the other thing that's really great about The Hunting Ground is that because it was so well publicized, there was a case that um, about a, a film that we're going to be coming out in September. We just had it some Sundance called Audrey and Daisy, and I really urge any of you who have high school kids um, or grandchildren um, in your lives to watch this film because it's about it's about the rape and sexual assault in high school, but it's really about the social media, the role that social media plays in cyberbullying and in what I would call slut shaming. This idea that people take pictures or they 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 target these girls, they put things up on the internet. It's so out of control, and yet no, nobody's ever lived in this landscape before, so nobody quite knows what to do it, about it. And this film, Audrey and Daisy, um, another example of The Hunting Ground was, there was a young girl, she was a freshman in high school, never been to a party before, high school party. Goes to a party, gets very drunk. Three boys that were sophomores raped her. They wrote all over her body with Sharpies, very vulgar things, took pictures and put it on the internet. A week later, she hung herself. So the judge, because um, these kids are under 16, you know, they're, they're, they're 16, they're not, they're in, still in juvenile um, detention land. Um, he made it part of their sentencing that they watch The Hunting Ground, that they participate in the film Audrey and Daisy, and that their community service <coughs> to talk to other high schools about what they learned. And again, the parents have got these major law forms saying, that's not fair, they've been punished enough, they've suffered enough. And the other, the other side of that is, somebody else lost their daughter. She's dead, she's gone, she hung herself, right? So there, there's, there's such um, a need not to be punitive, but to have these conversations really early on with our kids about what is consent, what is the role of alcohol, what, you know, all of the, all of the things that they're, they're, um, our kids are now navigating um, in this very, um, very kind of laissez-faire world, um, especially in, on the media side of things. Um, so that film's coming out in, um, in the fall on Netflix, and, and uh, already has made a huge difference, and California's changed three laws um, around consent, so that right now, it, it, the idea of it, anybody that has any kind of sexual intercourse with somebody that is intoxicated, by definition, it's rape, and it's, it's, it's a crime. So, just, um, it seems pretty obvious, but it, it's not, unfortunately. So those were, um, that's Audrey right there, the little kid's dress, waving. Um, and that's her dad, um, and her dad and mom uh, passed the legislation in California just two weeks ago. Um, so I think I'll just, I'll kind of close with that, and maybe you can I'll open it up to questions if anybody has any questions. I mean, I know it's kind of boring to listen to me talk versus watching the clips, but. Um, does anybody have any questions? What have you done before? So, yeah, so the first movie that I made was something called The Day My God Died, and I did it with Andy Levine, who's also from Groland, Massachusetts. Um, and it was a film about the child sex slave trade between Nepal and India. And then um, while traveling in India, I met a photographer in Calcutta 
who was photographing the brothels, the red light district, so born into brothels was the next movie. And um, and then I've done, I'm mostly interested in kind of human rights issues and um, a, lot, a lot of the work that I personally get very involved with has to do with, um, with um, women and, and girls and, and sort of abuse, sexual abuse and, and trauma. Um, but I've also made a lot of really fun films too, like we had a film called Alive Inside, which if any of you haven't seen it, it's, um, it's a film uh, that really looks at how music can help people who have Alzheimer's regain their um, memory and speech. Um, literally, it's like there was a clip that went viral, there was this beautiful African-American man named Henry who was like went viral on the internet and he was like asleep in a sloppy joe for like 20 years and then somebody put these headsets on with an iPod and started playing some church music that he used to sing and he sat up and he just started to sing and then he remembered people and so the social worker that saw this started to test it out more and more and more and more and more and um, and we got very excited about the film because it was you know joyful it was about music and but the results you know, what we were able to do with the film is amazing because we we're able to get Medicare to now reimburse people for iPods and headsets because it reduces the cost of, um, of, uh, of narcotics by like sevenfold. Um, and the other thing that was really great about it is, um, uh, I don't know if you know this, but the most regulated industry in the country is nuclear energy. And the second most regulated industry are nursing homes. And that's because when, when, when we first started Social Security and nursing homes, there was a lot of elder abuse, like you know, people ha warehousing elderly people, not feeding them, taking money. So it, it became a very regulated industry in like the 1940s. Um, so now, you, you, anybody can go into a nursing home, state or federal, and, and make sure you're in compliance. And if you're not, you get slapped a fine. And that somebody had the good sense to say that that money doesn't just go into the state coffers, it goes into a fund that improves the living of the elderly living in nursing homes. So there's all these nursing homes and assisted living homes that actually have pots of money that haven't had so we, you know things that we could do. So we didn't have to go out and raise all this money to get headsets and iPods for all these nursing homes. We just had to introduce people to the program and um, the, the training of uh, staff um, was done through you know the money that um, that was available because of the fines that were um, imposed, and one of the great things about that was that uh, you know the, the the caretakers said that the, their patients were less agitated, but the more, more beautiful thing was is that um, they had their families visit more, and they they they, they documented that they, their families on average visit three times more, and they stay five times longer. So if you're like in a room with someone that doesn't know you're there, or you don't know if they're there, and music's playing, you're talking about the music. Oh, Dad, remember that? Blah, blah, blah. Even if you can't get anything back, but if you're if you're not, it's like that awkwardness. <coughs> like he's not even he doesn't even know I'm here. Why am I here? I should go. You know, it's just so so the the kind of social impact of this program has been beautiful. So much so that in Wisconsin, where they have it um, in uh, across the state. Their results have been so great that they decided that they would adopt it for hospice. And there's a big debate with the hospice community because, you know, usually if you're in hospice, it's usually two to four weeks. So the idea was, do you really want to go through the training? You don't really buy these things. People are at the end of their life. And the woman, the head of it, said, no, I'm, I'm just convinced this is going to make a difference. And they had the same kind of results where people visited longer, there was less um, morphine being used, and most importantly, um, people got to say goodbye to people that they loved in a conscious state. People got to say, I'm sorry and I love you. And that was like huge breakthroughs for families. And so she said, we changed our mission statement um, at hospice, um, which was uh, providing comfort at the end of life. And they've changed it to providing comfort and joy because they now have a music and memory program. So those are the kinds of things that you can't, you know, you just can't put a price tag on. You don't, can't really quantify, it can't, doesn't show up in a study, but, but you know it's making a difference. And, and I have had so many people after seeing that movie saying, the first thing I did was I went home and I interviewed my dad and I made, you know, instead of a bucket list, I'm gonna, do, I'm gonna make a playlist. And so it's like we did campaigns around, what's your playlist, you know, instead of just what's your bucket list? Like what are the songs that you share together? Um, 
So it's a great exercise to think about uh, with your kids and um, actually may actually keep you connected to them in a way that you, you can't anticipate now. Um, Benny would be great because he's a he's an old <laughs> DJ. He's got, got a great playlist. <laughs> and I was thinking about my dad's playlist. I was actually thinking about nighttime on the city of New Orleans, and my mother's uh, would be the um, what's that gospel song that we used to have to listen to if we were up late at night? And all. Oh, happy days! Oh, happy days! So she didn't believe she didn't believe in uh, curfews, but. It, if you were out late, guess what you got all woken up to it? Oh, happy day! <laughs> so, so anyway, those at least would be the songs that I would remember from when I'm growing up with my parents. But um, no, that was a beautiful, beautiful film. And the other film that I did that's on Netflix that's really funny, it's called Meet the Patels, and it's about this first generation Indian family who comes to Michigan State um, with $17 in his pocket. And then his kids are grown, they're raised American. So it's sort of like my big fat Greek wedding um, Indian style because his, he turns 30, the main subject of the film turns 30 and he's not married and his parents are just beside themselves because his mother is like a matchmaker and his, they, all their other cousins are married. And so I mean, they spend a year trying to get him to um, be, have an arranged marriage. So that it's, it's sort of a look at Western love versus arranged marriage, and it's just hilariously funny. Um, and we're determined to do more funny movies because most of the movies that I do, people say they want to slit their wrists after they say that. <laughs> 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 so we're trying to find ways to bring humor to very important subjects. Yes. What's epic coming? Oh, you what's epic? Stay in Utah? I'm not. I'm gonna stay in Utah at least for uh, my. I have a son who's 16 and he's a junior in high school, so he's got two more years high school. And um, my daughter Makara is uh, gonna be a junior in college, and what she's doing? she's actually interested in film. She's gonna work in uh, a movie this summer in New York. Um, and uh, so I'm gonna be in Utah for at least couple more years after that, I don't know. <coughs> yes? Did you have a more difficult time getting the men to say that they were sexually <coughs> yes. assaulted? I would think that's still kind of, you know. A, yeah. Uh, yeah, I know there's still a lot of, um, a lot of shame around that. Um, and there's also a lot of homophobic rape too, a lot of gay, gay men and gay women that get raped because of their gender. And so there's a lot of, like, there's now we're sort of seeing a lot more tolerance around understanding the spectrum of gender um, in our culture. Talk about a belief system that's changed. That, that's, there's probably been no, nothing more transformational than what's happened with the LGBT community, certainly in my lifetime, um, in terms of people understanding. And, and again, I would say that film had a big role in that, and I would say that this idea that Harvey Milk would say, come out, tell people you're different. So that people aren't afraid of us, you know, and so and then or tell your story. Well, I was bullied because I, you know, couldn't throw a baseball, and I was this, and you say, well, that's not right. Well, we can do better than that, right? And so, um, you know, whether, I mean, it, that's just been a huge, a huge difference. Um, and certainly, my children grew up thinking, what is this big deal about this? I remember I was the the day that Mitt Romney past gay marriage in Massachusetts. I was taking my kids from the library home in Salt Lake. And there was this, it was also the 50th anniversary of Brown versus the Board of Education, same day. And so they were reading these letters on NPR that Lyndon Johnson, this hate mail that Lyndon Johnson got because of Brown versus integrating schools. And my kids were like, that really happened? And I said, you know, you're going to say that. Your kids are going to say that to you 50 years from now around this gay marriage thing. You're going to say, what? I mean, people weren't allowed to get married. Did they love somebody? Yeah, your, your kids are going to say that to you. And, and that's right. what, you know. So anyway, that's, uh, that's uh, I don't know how I got there, but that's. <laughs> yes? I wonder how you rate Massachusetts compared to some of the other states that you've been in about working towards responding to rape situation. Well, you know, um, 
a lot of the schools on the 174 list are from Boston, but we also have a very high concentration of schools here in New England and in Boston. Um, I would say that I'm very proud of the leadership that Drew Faust has given this at Harvard. Um, and uh, you know, one, another example of kind of rape, what I would call rape culture, where you just sort of go along with this belief that things have to be the way that they were. So a classmate of mine at Harvard a year ahead of me started a company called Sam Adams Beer. Right? Mm -hmm. Turns out he's the chair of like the most prestigious vinyl club at Harvard called the Porcellian. Mm -hmm. And after this, this this report came out and they realized that most of the assaults happen in finals clubs. Like a lot of assaults happen in fraternities. Like Harvard doesn't have fraternities, but they have these finals clubs. So they made the recommendation, the, study, the committee made the recommendation that Harvard um, gender, not gentrify, but allow women to become part of finals clubs. And people were just going nuts, you know. It's like, remember when Lorna Kimball wanted to be part of the hate book country club? Well, yeah. Yeah. do that by the time So, anyways, this guy, who's a friend of mine, you know, who I went to school with, he said, he comes out with a position, which is just shows you how he, how imbued he is in his own culture. And he said, that's a really bad idea. There'll be more sexual assault if we let women in finals clubs. <laughs> As opposed to, whose responsibility is it to not rape somebody? <laughs> you know, like, why are we having this conversation, again, that women are going to be the problem if they're in this finals club? As opposed to, let's talk about what respect, consent, mutual, mutual you know, like, but that's the negotiation that we have to have a conversation around. Not that it's going to be worse because women are going to be allowed in finals clubs. Well, the guy was forced to resign. He got, like, but, but, and you know, and, and he's a good guy. He's just, not, you know, like maybe 10 years from now he'll say, you know, I just, I didn't know that. I, 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 I you know, I'm, I'm going to rethink that. <laughs> Any other questions? What's happening with the hunting ground? I didn't hear the end of it. So they deep sixed it when it came out. Well, so right now, right now, the only way you can see the hunting ground is on Netflix. So CNN is never going to show it again. They gave us, gave it back to us. And yet in your library, and in your library, <laughs> libraries all over the country, a lot. Libraries all over, yeah. yeah. You can you, out right now. Yeah, you can you can, you can get it at your library on Netflix. Um, and I will say that, you know, it's very exciting to me how many colleges have just adopted that as part of freshman orientation they're showing the film. So the conversation is part of, you know, you have, have conversations about alcohol, you have conversations about consent. And in, in the in, with the Invisible War, 70% of any person going into the military today in basic training launches Invisible War. So at least you're getting the education targeted to the places where um, you want the conversation to be happening. But it will not be shown on CNN again. And it was in theaters for a minute, because who wants to go date <laughs> night for a rape movie, you know, in the, of the summer, which is when it came out. Yeah. <laughs> so it didn't really do well in the box office. But <laughs> well, have, you, have you ever spoken to one that's been a personal victim? Oh, yeah. 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 Many. Yeah. Many. Are your documentaries available in the library? A lot of them are. Um, a lot of them are, and most libraries carry born into brothels. Um, many of them carry alive inside. We do a movie called The Cove, which is about dolphin killing in Japan that won an Academy Award. Um, another film called The Square, which was about the Egyptian Revolution, that's in a lot of libraries just because it was such a historical moment. Um, uh, so, yeah, I mean, we have a we have a website called um, ImpactFilms.com. You can look at the films, and I, I bet you. 90% of them are now on Netflix or in libraries. Impactfilms.com. Impact, um, Impactfilms.com. So we have no sound, but there's nothing we can see on the screen? Unfortunately, I mean, it was just like a major tech. This is why you need to like not be against taxes so you can get infrastructure in places like the town hall. Just saying, teachers and libraries, man, they don't get paid very much. <laughs> <laughs> if we were in the library, this would be working right now. Oh, see, this is a live inside. This is a live inside. That's one of the people from the live inside. Yeah, but you can't really. You can shut that light off. You can shut that light off. I heard it. We tried this before. Carolyn.
I mean, we can just run through the clips. I mean, they're only a couple of minutes long on each one. Yeah. Yeah. And then you'll at least you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> So this, um, I'm, I got involved with this because I saw um, Killing Me Softly when I was a freshman in college, which looked at the media. Um, Keen Kilpatrick did the film, and it changed my thinking radically, made me change my major in sociology and look at media. And um, people said, oh, that movie's been done. And I said, no, it's, there's more of a backlash now 
with media, with women, than it was 30 years ago. It just is. Um, so that's why we made that film. And then we made a companion piece to what the media teach our boys. Thing, you know what was happening, and it came to across the country. 
Story Press the Audrey button. Obviously, um, takes her life, and then Daisy had a very similar thing happen to her. And again, you know, it's unfortunate that this like freshman girls, older guys, um, and her mother lost her job. Um, they, the town, 
because the, the, the kid that was uh, that uh, um, had sexually assaulted her was actually a football star, and his father was a his uncle was a state senator. They actually burned their house down. Um, the town actually burned their house down <laughs> uh, because they the mother kept trying to press charges, and um, it was a really tragic situation because this family had been they lived in Buffalo, New York, and. Their father who was tragically killed in a car accident. So they just lost their father, and the mother was a veterinarian, and decided that they would move to this little town in Missouri just to get away from all the memories of losing her husband and her father. And then in within three months, this happens to their child. And, um, and she then went through a very dark stage of goth and cutting and, you know, just just really, really deep depression, and um, her older brother is kind of the hero because he was on the football team, he knew the kids that did it, and he ended up becoming a coach because of this, because he wanted to teach boys to be different. Um, but uh, it's, it's a, and Audrey now is a national spokesperson on this issue, and not Audrey, excuse me, Daisy is a national spokesperson on the issue. So a lot of the things that, when bad things happen, people then turn it into something that they didn't choose, you know, Anita Hill didn't choose to go. Her life path was changed very differently, very, very dramatically by agreeing to testify about Clarence Thomas. She didn't choose it, but it changed her life and she made a huge difference. And that's the other part of what I'm always interested in is like what people do when bad things happen to them. How do they, how do they wrestle them to the ground or how do they move through them? Um, at what cost? And what do they learn? And what do they have to teach us? So. Sorry, the sound wasn't as good as it could have been, but um, yeah. thank you for your patience.